Okay. Um, yeah, feel free to start whenever you, whenever you want to. Yes, thanks. So thanks uh, for inviting me. And uh, as, as in the introduction it was said, this talk will be about integrable Lindblad equations. And more generally, it is about um, computing non-equilibrium dynamics in integrable models, or in specific cases when integrable model is also connected with the environment. And then, uh, I mean, I, I put forward that uh, this work has lots of technical details, and perhaps I will not go into much of the technical details. I plan to give a perhaps a little bit longer introduction into what we are trying to do and why we are doing it, what is our goal, and uh, how far we can get actually. And then, I mean, maybe in the second part or close to the end, we can also discuss technical details about this young monster integrability uh, and, and what we can do with it. So for this general framework, okay, so what are we, what, what do we want to do? Uh, I will uh, discuss Lindblad equation in more detail as we progress, but first as a rough, rough idea, we are talking about Lindblad equation when we want to simulate interaction of a model, some uh, physical model that we want to look at with some environment, in cases when the environment is very big. And this has some importance for experiments and uh, for, for simulating experiments or computing actual physical quantities so that we can compare with experiments. But this is a very broad and difficult problem. So already, already when we want to simulate a closed quantum mechanical problem, a quantum mechanical system, it's already pretty difficult. So when we want to combine it with the interaction with the environment, it becomes even much more difficult. So what can we do with it? The input equation is one of the possible ways so that we can approximate this uh, rather complicated problem and do something with it. But before we go to Lindblad equation, I want to give a little bit of introduction into non-equilibrium dynamics of integrable models, because this will motivate somehow what we want to do and why we want to go to comparison with experiments and how and what precisely is the physics. So when, 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 we, when we talk about non-equilibrium dynamics of integrable models, we can discuss two concepts separately, a little bit of introduction. So what do I mean by non-equilibrium dynamics and what do I mean by integrable models? So first, non-equilibrium dynamics, what, uh, what we have in mind is really, is really non-equilibrium situations of many sorts, but we, may, maybe we can focus on two types of things. And one type of thing is the concept of a quantum quench or some similar, similar non-equilibrium dynamical uh, situations. So we have some kind of initial state psi zero and then we can say that we, we have a Hamiltonian and Hamilton, Hamilton, Hamiltonian H, but I can just uh, forget the head notation. We will talk about uh, quantum mechanical operators, and we have time evolved uh, state as a function of time, C of T. And then we want to look at physical properties of the time evolved state when we know some properties of Hamiltonian and some properties of initial state. For example, we want to compute time evolution of, of uh, local observables, where this is the mean value of a local observable in the time evolved state. And then perhaps we also want to look at infinite time limit and then uh, uh, look at uh, so called stationary states, what emerge during unitary time evolution here. And by stationary states, we mean that we pick some kind of local observables and we look at mean values how they behave. So this is, this is the setting roughly of the quantum quench, very well studied in many, many, many systems, integrable or non integrable. And then specifically, what people wanted to look at starting from roughly 2010 onwards uh, is consider these situations when H is an integrable model, mostly an integrable spin chain, but sometimes people also look at other integrable models like Bose gas or uh, maybe even quantum field theories. So we need to discuss what is an integrable model, but first, coming, first let us uh, consider one more type of problem here, namely problems of transport. So when we talk about when we talk about quenches, then usually here it is assumed that psi zero is translationally invariant. So we don't have much of, well, we don't have no space, we don't have any kind of space dependence of the initial state. However, in transport, we really want to see how physical properties get transport from one side of the spin chain to the other side, for example. So in these in these transport problems, a typical, typical setting that people consider is an initial state, which is such that it's somehow the state has two halves uh, with respect to um, uh, space. So like we can say that we are, we are stationary in one dimension, we are fixed variable, and the system is split into two parts such that we have some kind of prepared state here and some kind of prepared state here. 
and the two can have different physical properties. For example, this has higher temperature than this one. And initially, this, this has higher temperature, then as time evolves, Hamiltonian is switched on. There will be, for example, a heat transport which flows from here to here. And then people wanted to look at the properties of this transport and different types of behavior of transport. It turns out that if the model is integrable, then we can have ballistic transport, which is a characteristic of uh, integrable models. It happens very often, but then we can also have diffusive transport. And in some cases, also more exotic things like so called super diffusive transport in certain spin chains or uh, other uh, integrable models. So I did not discuss these different types of behaviors. I'm just saying that these were two main uh, uh, problems that people looked at in the last 10 years uh, globally, invariant, uh, transitional invariant, global branches, and then transport properties. And then in the immediate, I mean, Starting from 2010, there were not so much, uh, there was not so much progress, but uh, maybe I can say from 2014, 2015, what people understood for integrable models is that uh, states, the, 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 co the concept of the so-called generalized Gibbs ensemble emerged, I will discuss it in a little bit later, which generalized Gibbs ensemble uh, describes the long time average or long time limit of these states which emerge here. And then even later from 2016, 17, etc., so on, the theory of generalized hydrodynamics also emerged. And generalized hydrodynamics somehow builds on the GG, but it can describe transport properties uh, in these systems. So it describes flow of conserved charges under time evolution, which is given by integrated Hamiltonian. And perhaps you have heard talks about GHT. I mean, Benjamin Doyon talks very often about these types of properties. But I'm sure that you also you, you encountered the concept of GG already. But actually, I did not talk about it. This is just the framework what people want to look at or wanted to look at. And uh, even later, I will come to, to the Lindblad equation, which is a little bit new addition to this. Because I mean, here, when we discuss these problems, this is always for closed systems, which are not in contact with the environment, which are separated from the environment. And then we will add interaction with the environment. But before we move on, I want to discuss properties of integrability of uh, spin chain and then also generalized Gibbs ensemble just a little bit. So, <clears throat> what, what is integrability? What is concept of integrability? I mean, there is in, in classical physics, we understand it very well that uh, complete integrability is when we have enough charges that the phase states can be foliated and basically solved with good action angle variables. Uh, quantum integrability is a little bit more complicated concept, and I think there is no general definition of what this means. In some sense, integrability means predictability and exactly solvability. So we can, there is no chaos, we can predict what is happening in the model and perhaps we can actually really solve it. But exact solvability and integrability, for me, they are two different concepts in a little bit, I mean, not, not completely identical. Because even when we establish the so-called integrability of a certain model, some very well defined properties about charges, etc., what I will discuss here. It does not mean that we can actually solve the model. So, actual exact solvability comes after establishing integrability in some sense. So, so what, what is then this integrability that, that I'm talking about? Um, as I said, in quantum case, there is no general definition which fits every integrable model, but a very often accepted definition is that a spin chain Hamiltonian or some other Hamiltonian is integrable if there exists a set of conserved charges to alpha, so they are operators, where alpha is an index, it's an index which can go, for example, over integer numbers up to infinity, such that these are operators, they are extensive and uh, 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 mutually commuting operators. Let, let me describe important properties. So if they are such that two alpha and two beta commute when alpha is beta, uh, alpha and beta are different. And they are operators which are extensive operators with the local charge. So in a spin chain, this means that two alpha is such that it is given by a summation over some spin, uh, no, some charge density. Let's put it like this, localized inside the J. So J is a coordinate going from one to infinity or, or sorry, minus infinity to infinity on an infinite spin chain. And this is the charge density. And this charge density should be local. And locality means that a range, 
so the so called range of this operator density should be some finite number and typically it can be chosen as just this index alpha, such that, uh, for example, Q1 can be identified, for example, with particle number or, or spin global spin z operator. Then Q2 can be identified with nearest neighbor Hamiltonian if you have a nearest neighbor spin chain model. But then there are other charges, Q3, Q4, etc., which are three sides, four sides, etc., charges, and they should all commute with each other. So this means that we have extensive and commuting charges, so conservation laws, and the clear living value of these charges is conserved during time evolution of, of a fine model. And this has consequences for dynamics. So if you have more, more conservation laws, dynamics must be more restricted. Less dynamical processes can happen. And this leads to the concept of uh, completely elastic and factorized scattering. I will not explain now what this means because it would take too much. It simply means that the S matrix in the theory is what is called two body reducible. So the two, two particle scattering completely determines n particle scattering processes. Um, I can also put this property in, in another form, namely, there is no, um, no energy transfer, no momentum transfer, and no transfer of other charges uh, during scattering processes. This means that, for example, if, if I send a large, large energy excitation into a, our model, which is integrable, then physical properties of uh, physical uh, not, not property, uh, consequences of scattering is that high energy excitation cannot transfer its energy to low energy modes. It will not be lost as in diffusive processes or friction or something like this. It, it will uh, stay conserved. But the only effect of uh, scattering on the dynamical processes is that the, the speed of propagation, so called semi classical speed of propagation, can be changed during the scattering process. I mean, it would take more time to explain this, but the, the key idea is that there is no momentum transfer, no energy transfer into, into low energy excitations, what would usually happen. And from this property, you can show that there are persistent talents and there is ballistic transport in these, in these systems. So somehow this is this is the starting point which which leads to this generalized hydrodynamics that I mentioned, and also another key property of existence of these charges is that the low time limit of quantum quenches leads to this generalized Gibbs ensemble. So what is this? I mean, the idea is very simple, and I think that I mean you, you, you most of you have must have heard it in, in some kind of previous talks or somewhere. So the idea is that. Instead of the usual Gibbs ensemble, what we have in a, in a normal uh, system, the long time limits, steady states in the long time limit, are given by the generalized Gibbs ensemble, which is such that the, the density matrix of the GGE will be written as a, some normalization factor multiplied by exponential of minus summation over all charges, uh, lambda alpha. Alpha. I mean, if there would be just the usual conserved charges here, like energy and particle number, then we would have Gibbs ensemble and Boltzmann weights. But here in these models, because all of the charges are conserved, they should enter the canonical description of uh, statistical physical ensembles, micro canonical and canonical. And that's why they have to enter the Boltzmann weights and also the Gibbs ensemble here. In what sense do, do we talk about the GGE? I mean, uh, of course, if you have if you have the unitary time evolution or acting on some initial state, this unitary time evolution always conserves all information of initial state. So we do not say that the density matrix goes to this density matrix in a, in a big volume. It, it's not true. What is happening is if we are looking at local operators or some other operators which are confined into some region of space, the mean values of these local operators will mean values of these operators in time of state will go to the values which is predicted by the generalized Gibbs ensemble. So in a very large volume, time evolution conserves information. So information is not lost, but when we are looking at uh, reduced density matrices corresponding to a small segment of the chain, then we see emergence of the generalized Gibbs ensemble, this, this density matrix, basically. And then this is why integrable models are special. Because already for global branches, we see something more complicated than the usual Gibbs ensemble. And then, uh, if you, so this is for global branches. 
And then when we look at uh, initial states which are trans not, not translational invariant, then you would have transport properties and for example, this ballistic transport that I mentioned and generalized, generalized hydrodynamics can be used to describe ballistic transport. Of course, at this point, you can ask uh, what is the practical uh, application of this GGE? So if you have in practice some kind of initial state and some kind of Hamiltonian, what can you do with this? I mean, can you determine the Lagrange multipliers or can you effectively compute or predict final states, uh, final correlation functions? And the answer is yes, but that's a topic for a separate talk and it's, uh, it's technical. But in, uh, in these so called beta and absorbable models like Heisenberg's two chain or related models, this is now understood. And uh, also, I mean, the understanding what was gained from GGE. It went into the hydrodynamics, which is uh, uh, which describes transport. Sorry, sorry. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, uh, so now the Hamiltonian is integrable, yeah. and when we increase the system from initial state to I mean, integrable Hamiltonian, then we are getting this generalized Gibbs ensemble. Yeah. But now my question is, if are, are there any limitations on the initial state that if the initial state should come from, for example, the ground state of the integrable Hamiltonian, or for example, if the ground state is coming from the, sorry, if the initial state is coming from the non-integrable Hamiltonian, are we gonna still get the generalized Gibson ensemble at the end? Yeah, 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 the statement is yes. So the, 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 the notion of the GGE does not depend on the initial state. So the statement is that for any kind of initial state which is physically meaningful, such that it comes from some kind of what is meaningful. I mean, I should discuss. So, so this should have some kind of nice local properties, like uh, what is this uh, rule? Um, uh, cluster property. So, so when this this uh, state should satisfy cluster property of state of so in space. That uh, anyway, I, I don't want to go there. But if it is meaningful and somehow local in space then the GG should hold. And it should not matter whether this is a ground state of uh, integrable or non-integrable Hamiltonian. And the separate question, what can be asked is, what happens if this state has special properties? And by special, I mean, we should figure out what are these special properties because it's not immediately evident. But it turns out that there is a class of initial state, uh, sorry, class of initial state which are called integrable initial states. So integrable uh, yeah, initial state psi zero where more things can be computed. I mean, still not everything exactly, but somehow uh, there is also integrability hidden in the initial state. And it turns out that these initial states are not, not ground states of another integrable Hamiltonian. No, they are generated by some local, local update rule, no, not update rule, local, um, local rules for the construction of the state. It's a separate topic. But anyway, anyway there, is a, there is a notion of integrability also specifically for initial state. Uh, is this good answer? Yes, 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 thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and then this was, what I discussed so far is really just introduction into basic non-equilibrium setting what people looked at. And now I'm coming to this Lindblad equation and why, why I want to do it. So let me raise this. All of what I had so far is for closed systems where there is no environment. And then people actually looked at uh, simulation of experiments. So there are experiments with integrable models nowadays, or at least in the last, not, not only nowadays, I don't know, last uh, 10 years maybe, uh, with ultra cold atoms and such. For example, this famous experiment of the so-called quantum Newton crater, it was published in Nature, maybe you have heard it in, in previous talks. So people can actually, uh, so to say, tailor these systems in, in making, maybe I can say quantum simulators or uh, yeah, experiments with ultra cold atoms. So they, so they actually create, they can create a, a setting in an experiment where motion of atoms, for example, in one dimension is really well described by an integrable model. It can be sometimes lattice model or it can be a continuous model like so-called Lieblinger model, one the Bosegas. But then uh, when, when you actually go and try to simulate the experiment, so really somehow hook up numerical data to compare with experiment, you are faced with the problem that in an experiment, the model is never integrable. So integrability is a, is a somehow, how to say, isolated concept. So it is, it is very rigid and it's very easy to break it. I mean, of course, nature is not integrable and, and you have little interactions of various sorts and integrability is lost. 
And then the question is, can you somehow treat integrability breaking still within your theories? So in, your, in these experiments with, uh, for example, rubidium gases in, in ultra cold experiments, the system is, is very close to integrable. So effect of integrability breaking is small. And then people wanted to look at how can we modify our theories a little bit so that they are close to integrability and we can take into account small effects of integrability breaking. And this should be, again, non-perturbative. So maybe, maybe it, is, it is perturbative in the strength of integrability breaking in some sense, maybe you can say this, but you would want to take into account the full solution of your integrable model. That's important. So the integrable model is strongly interacting. Uh, you want to take all of its dynamics into account and perhaps integrability breaking with the environment, maybe this is small and maybe you can treat it better. And then uh, there are two types of integrability breaking. So, so what, what I would call uh, inner integrability breaking and outer integrability breaking. I mean, this is just my concept. So you will not find it in papers. I mean, it's just so that we understand each other. So an inner, inner integrability breaking is when you have a Hamiltonian, somehow H here there, which is H zero, an integrable Hamiltonian plus some, uh, I don't know, coupling constant lambda times some perturbation P. So we are still in the Hamiltonian framework. We are looking only at our model. There is no talking of environment or anything, but we have a term or multiple terms in Hamiltonian, which is integrability breaking. And we want to do something with it. And then the other problem is the, when there is an what I call outer integrability breaking somehow, is this when, when, when uh, the Lindvall equation appears, when we imagine that we have our, our system, which is described by integrable Hamiltonian H0, and it's embedded in a big environment, and then there is uh, interaction with the environment. And you want to take this interaction with the environment into account, and you want to do it such that you will get uh, somehow a reduced equation for the density matrix row of your model, which is sends you your system. And there is attempts to treat integrability breaking in both uh, ways. And now today I will talk about this second second type, which is in the interaction with the environment. But first, for motivation, so what are we looking at? Uh, well, what type of integrability breaking do we have? So that is actually, there is this experiment, what I mentioned, quantum uh, Newton grader, published in uh, Nature, Nature Physics. I, I don't uh, remember specifically. You can look it up on, on, on the archive. In, in this experiment, they take rubidium atoms and they place rubidium atoms into a trap, one dimensional trap. Atoms can move in, in 1D such that it is strongly confining in, into 1D and then there is a potential in the, in the remaining one uh, remaining space direction, which is uh, weakly confining so that uh, atoms can move here back and forth, but basically only along this line. And then what happens is that they take like a thousand uh, or two thousand atoms and they put it here into this potential and then atoms start to move and then they will do something. And then you want to look uh, how density profile uh, behaves as a function of time, for example. And in these types of system, the typical integrability breaking effect is atomic loss, which means that uh, in practice, atoms simply fall out of the trap. I mean, you, you put them in there, and then there are effects such that the experiment just loses atoms. And then this atomic loss is such that it is not, not uniform uh, when you want to, uh, when you have to, what is this? Um, uh, so, so when you look at atomic loss as a function of momentum of, of uh, particles, then it's not uniform. And if you want to, if you want to take into account the atomic loss exactly, or well, not exactly, but as accurately as possible, then you will need to understand what is the rate of atomic loss when you view it as a function of momentum of particles, for example. And then you want to do something with this atomic loss. You want to understand how this atomic loss influences your GG. So, for example, you can you can assume that there is a GG, an equilibrated state here in this in this uh, in this potential somehow. It's also space dependent because you have here this uh, trap, but uh, some modification of GG can be written down. And then you want to understand how atomic loss influences the GG, how it becomes maybe time dependent, and how that in practice how atoms fall out of the trap, and what is its effect on local observables that you want to see, uh, measure. That. And that's why you want to have a theory or some kind of methods to, to handle these integrability breaking terms, which come from interaction of the environment. 
And then this is where the this is where the Lincoln equation comes into picture. So the maybe people in the audience know much more about Lindgren equation than I do. I mean, I'm I'm, uh, I'm really not an expert. I just looked at it for these integrable integrable cases, integrable situations. In any case, put very simply, Lindgren equation is a linear equation, which is a time evolution equation for the density matrix rho. So we are not in pure states, we are talking about density matrix, such that it takes into account interaction with environment by effectively tracing out the degrees of freedom of the environment. In, in order to have a Lindgren equation, it's an approximation. For this approximation, you need an environment which is uh, in some kind of uh, thermal state, and it should be uh, response of the environment should be uncorrelated. So it should be a quickly thermalizing environment. And then you can make a good approximation for the Lindbad equation. But again, I'm not uh, I'm not an expert, so maybe I'm, I'm sure that uh, people in the audience would give a would give a better introduction into Lindbad equation. But I, I will show you how it looks like. And I need to have a cheat cheating because I always forget uh, signs and factors and these kind of things. So we have we have a density matrix, and we, we want to look at time evolution of, of density matrix. And then we have a we have a Lindblad so-called super operator, which will be a integral, no, not integral. First is a linear operator for the row, such that the time dependence of your uh, density matrix is the linear operator acting on your row, and it has the following action. First of all, it has the commutator, the Hamiltonian. This is in usual quantum mechanics. So in usual quantum mechanics, time evolution of that. You know, density operator is given by this computer. But then we have the Lindblad terms. So we have the summation over operators. I'm sorry, somebody is uh, drilling, which is strange. I hope you can still hear me, but they are drilling somewhere in this building. I hope it's, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, so it sounds fine. Huh? It sounds fine to me at least. Okay, okay. It's annoying for me, but anyway. So we have, we have a summation over. Uh, lin so called Linda operators, where these Linda operators are uh, some operators L indexed with A, and L acts on the Hilbert space of your model. And then uh, the corresponding action of the density matrix is the following you have LA rho density matrix LA dagger minus one half times LA dagger LA uh, anti commutator with so I will not, I will not uh, tell you how to derive this equation. You can look it up in, in standard books. I'm just saying that if you want to look at time evolution of rho, which conserves trace of rho, which is physical environment, then actually the Bose general equation, I think, looks like this, where you have a set of operators, a full set of Lindbad operators. But in concrete, in concrete computations, in concrete uh, experimental situations, you would take fixed uh, Lindbad operator such as that the Lindbad operator actually gives you a process, a process which is mediated by the environment. So, so you can think about this operator some kind as an action of the environment on your system, on your field of space. And then for density matrix, I mean, this is what you get. And you can check that uh, trace of rho is conserved. So this is constant for any kind of L R. And then you would you would want to understand how the system behaves when you have specific types of Lindbad operators. And we can choose different types of Lindbad operators depending on uh, space mm, dependence or space structure. So typically what you would choose is either you would choose local or ultra-local uh, Lindbad operators, I will explain what it is, or you would choose somehow, uh, what is this, uh, how to call it? Um, not, not global, it's not a good word, but um, well, big, big, big wavelength. I don't know how it's called in the literature. Certainly not like this. But well, well, let me explain what it means. So, if, if you have a local Lindbad operator, then it is understood that on your system, this Lindbad operator or jump operator acts locally. So, for example, if you have atomic loss in this quantum Newton cradle experiment, then a Lindbad operator would give you just a, a action where one, two, or three particles fall out of the trap. But this has to happen locally. So, for example, if you have the so called Lindbad model, which is on the uh, Bose gas, then the Lindbad operator would be just, for example, the C operator, 
this is field operator of three linear model to some power, maybe power of three. And then this field operator depends on space, it is completely local. And what it does, it on a specific point, it takes three particles out. So this means that if three particles collide and they are on the same point at one time, then they fall out of the depth. And this is described by this linear operator. So it's one, it's one, one type of linear operator which is completely local. You can see it's a completely local action. And then a big wavelength operator would be some kind of link blood operator which spreads out over the full system. And I'm not an expert with experiments, but I was told that uh, these local operators are more relevant. So clearly for atomic loss, atomic loss, these are relevant because atomic losses happen locally. They really fall out locally when two or three particles collide. But even in spin chains, you could argue that if you want to tailor uh, these experiments, then the local interactions, lo lo I mean, local uh, limbal operators would come into play. So this gives motivation. And then so, so much about the limbal operator, and I'm, I'm at the half of my talk, and actually this is how, yeah, how I planned it. And now we want to go to what is actually the new research, what we did. So the new research is to somehow look at this type of situation with limbal operator integrability breaking, and look for situations where integrability is not lost. So this is perhaps a little bit counterintuitive. So how, how, can, how is it possible that it's not lost? I mean, so far we talked about losing integrability because typically this interaction, it breaks integrability in the typical case. And what we want to look at now is specific cases for the spring operator where this system of equations is actually integrable. So we look at specific interaction with the environment such that integrability is preserved. Uh, maybe you could argue that this is a different system because here we have added more interactions. So maybe it's a different system. I don't know what is the good way to look at it. And in any case, we want to see integrable examples for this equation. And more specifically, I want to look at equations where these limbal jump operators are local operators on the spin chain. And this is simple for technical reasons. So I want to look at spin chains where spin chain where H is Hamiltonian, nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. And I want to look at cases where limb of the jump operator is also nearest neighbor operator. So something, ha something is happening with the spin chain and I want to understand what is happening and how to compute it, but the action should be uh, local. And before I go on to discussing integrable limb of equations, just one more example for, for um, or maybe two more examples for uh, Lindbad equations, which are important. Um, it's not only, ability, it's not only for integrability breaking in the sense that I, I uh, explained so far, like atomic losses, but people also want to look at driven systems. So a good example is when you have a spin chain, which I denote like this. So th these are like your uh, quantum spins and some bit some near stable interaction between them. And you want to have a driving, for example, at the left end and then the right end. So people investigated this problem very often. For example, a driving is where you want to send particles now in, and here you want to send, I mean, not send, uh, take particles out of your system. So you want to control here a particle influx and here an outflux. And this control is by outer force. So it comes from the outside. It's very natural then to have a Lindwell equation where then you would have Lindwell operators only at the side one, and the enzyme, uh, Lindo operator here is uh, injection, Lindo operator here is some taking particle out. And then you can ask yourself what is property of these models. It's very natural that somehow, if you wait long enough, that will be a pattern, some kind of uh, spin pattern, for example, flowing through your chain. And people want to understand what is the spin pattern, how to compute these properties, et cetera, et cetera. So these driven systems are also very much interesting. Uh, for our models, I'm not looking at uh, boundary driving. I'm always looking at uh, driving uh, in the middle, or not, not middle, uh, bulk, bulk. So I'm looking at spin chains where I have uh, some spins, and then I have I can I can have some either either losses or maybe driving, but the driving happens all, always locally and in the bulk, and I will assume periodic boundary conditions. So simply, this is the, the setting I'm looking at. This is a separate problem. It, it is worth uh, investigating. It was uh, often investigated by uh, Tomasz Kruzan and uh, collaborators, but I'm not talking about this one now. Today I'm talking about bulk, which is a little bit new topic, less investigated. This was very thoroughly investigated. This is a little bit less understood. 
And uh, let me delete it. <coughs> so, as, as this introduction was uh, telling you, I want to look at integrable instances of uh, integrable instances of uh, Lindbergh equation with local Lindbergh operators. And for this one, we want to have a rewriting of this equation such that it reminds us more about spin chain language. And the rewriting is actually very natural. So you, you imagine that you have your basic matrix, and if you would have, uh, what is the difference between basic matrix and, and the state? I mean, if you if you wish, I can denote uh, a state like this. I mean, it's just a no notation that here is here is your input. No, it is your. Uh, uh, if you would take a matrix for that state, then you would draw a picture like this, where here you have some some matrices. But now I'm just drawing a state. So he, he is a, if, you have a, if you have a computational basis J where uh, uh, J goes from one to et cetera until N, if you have two bits, then only one, two, for example, which means up spin or down spin, then here you would have the, the input variables for your state or, or the computational basis, so to say, so J1, J2, et cetera, et cetera, until JL. And then somehow your, your state is a collection of numbers when you specify this, this uh, uh, the discrete coordinates, so to say. And what is your density matrix? I mean, your density matrix is, uh, is this uh, product for pure states and for mixed states, it is a sum of such objects. And then maybe I, I can draw it like this that uh, density matrix has somehow, uh, if it's a pure state, then it's like this because it's just this pure state product. I have two sets of indices, J1, etc., to JL, and maybe I1, no, I1, I2. Etc. until I L. And if it's not if it's not a pure state, then we have linear combinations of these kind of things. So there is some kind of interaction here. So this I want I want to rewrite this uh, Lindbergh equation for the density matrix such that it reminds us more to the Hamiltonian equation for a state of the spin chain. And for that, if we, if we have a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, then the nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. Somehow acts as a as a as a two side operator which acts on two uh, lo two local states and then we have a summation over this and the complicated dynamics emerges and we want to have some of this picture for the density matrix and it's very natural what is happening what is happening is that I want to I want to consider both the in and out indices at the local space and I want to make an enlarged state. So that usually here, here it was a Hilbert space C to the N. And from this, I want to consider both uh, in and out index. So I will take a, I will take a, a state uh, C to the N and uh, square. And then I will build a spin chain where uh, these are the, uh, the local states. So I want, I want to, well, yeah, I don't know how else to put it. I want to make I want to make a new uh, site which consists of both the in index and out index of, of our density matrix, and then it's very natural because when we look at this, then for these types of spin chain, what we have here, um, I can naturally interpret the action of Lin block terms and also this term on 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 this feature. I mean, this Hamiltonian how does it act? It acts with the commutator, so this Hamiltonian acts on the one hand side by one of the indices and also as a commutator, the other term on the other indices. So this is somehow one side action, other side of uh, other side action. And then these terms, they already couple the two sides. For example, here, this term, this term, you can see that there's a Lindbergh operator which acts on one side of the density matrix and also a Lindbergh operator which acts on the other side of the density matrix. Maybe I should put it like this acts here, this acts here, this is in. Oh, no, I mixed it up. Anyway, one side of the density matrix, other side of the density, of the density matrix. So, I, so these types of terms will actually couple the in and out indices somehow. I, I don't like a picture so that we, we understand it a little, little bit. L R will be an operator which couples the two indices, whereas this term does not couple. So if, if we just have this term, then a pure state remains a pure state. But for, as an action of these terms, it will uh, cease to be a pure state if you get mixed. This is also decoupled. And then the idea is uh, to write down somehow a speed chain Hamiltonian which just simulates through this action 
on, on these types of this type of uh, Hilbert space. And then what another another way of looking at it is just take these kind of indices. If I imagine it as a parallel spin chain and just put it down here. So we make an identification of uh, identification of vector space and dual space. And then we describe the same equation as if we wanted to do a um, spin chain model on an enlarged spin chain, where we have uh, basically two copies of your model, of our model at one side. And then for these two copies, we have we want to write down how this part of the equation acts and this part how it acts. So I, I will write down what we have. Uh, this is, I think, is actually, actually pretty uh, standard. So it was used before. I will write it uh, right here. <clears throat> Always losing the, I'm always losing the um, formulas. So the Lindblad operator, which will be now a linear operator acting on this enlarged uh, Hilbert space, so to say, is also local. It will be summation of a J Lindblad density acting on site J and J plus one, where I say that the Lindblad operator L uh, uh, X L R now. Is basically a local operator which acts on sites j and j plus one also. So either use the index a, but it will get uh, it will become a two side operator. And then this Lindblad density, so to say, will be minus i of Hamiltonian density acting on first copy of your spin chain sites j j plus one plus Hamiltonian acting on second copy. Of your spin chain uh, j j plus one these terms come from the commutator acting here or here and then we have the action of these these guys let me say that there is just one family of limbo operators which is translational invariant such that it becomes a two side operator and then i have uh, l j j plus one one l j j plus one two minus one half l uh, dagger acting on one j j plus one l acting on one j j plus one minus one half l acting on two j j plus one it's a transpose and l j j plus one acting on two it's just a complex one so what what, what, ha what happened here is that we identified the space of density matrix with this uh, double spin chain and in this picture, I just wrote down what is action of these operators. And here you see that this is the only term which couples the two sides of the density matrix because here we have operators acting on a first or second copy. And then these are again operators acting just on the single copy. So this acts on copy one, this acts on copy two. And now what, what we do is what, what the research work is actually about is look at Lindblad equations where we have a Lindblad super operator where this operator can be understood as a local density of an integrable Hamiltonian. So this is this is not Hermitian, of course. So you see that uh, somehow this, these are the Hermitian parts which come from Hermitian time evolution. But then this is this is not Hermitian. Uh, Lindblad equation is not Hermitian. Hermeticity is, is lost, but uh, the trace of the density matrix is preserved. So this, this is the physical requirement here. Um, and then what we want to do is apply the integrability techniques so that we find integrable models of this side. And now we, I mean, as I said, I do not want to go into the technical details of how to do it. Now at this point, let me roughly describe what we get. So the, <clears throat> the statement is, first of all, that there is a method for method for classification of integrable spin chain Hamiltonians, classification. I mean, this, this goes back to early days of many people working with integrability and more recently it was used in a, in a very well defined and strategic way by Marius Delay and collaborators. This, this method for classification allows you to find integrable models with some symmetry properties or if you fix local spaces, et cetera, et cetera. And we, but this was used only for Hermitian cases, so for real, real Hamiltonians so far. And now in our work, what we did, we took ideas of this method for classification, 
and we wanted to find linear equations. So we wanted to find non-addition Hamiltonians, if you wish, where Hilbert space is doubled and local density looks like this. And we, we performed this classification of, uh, of Lindbad densities, if you want, and we found new integrable cases. And for these new integrable cases, what we did, we could establish that it, they are integrable. Integrability means that there is a set of conserved charges, which in this case is not really a charge, but linear operators, which commute with this Lindbad superoperator. And we also show that they, the models belong to this class of so called Young Baxter integrable models. So Young Baxter integrability is an algebraic, algebraic property of integrable models. It shows that the models can be embedded into a framework of commuting transfer matrices and Young Baxter relation, Young Baxter equation, and uh, uh, these kind of things. But then the big question is if we find the Lindbad equations, I will give you examples later, can we compute time evolution? Because eventually, this is what people want to look at. So eventually, you want to have Lindbad equations which simulate your Hilbert experiments. So the question is, if you have an integrable Lindbad equation, can you compute time evolution or not? And then our answer is a little bit mixed. So what we have, we found examples for integrable Lindbad. I will show examples in a moment. For these integrable Lindbad, we could compute what is the non-equilibrium steady state. Uh, where will the system go when we wait long enough time? What is the property of this non equilibrium steady state? We could compute it, it's a simpler problem. So, non equilibrium steady state is what arises in the t goes to infinity limit. So, you can ask yourself what is density matrix at uh, infinite times? How does it look like? What are physical properties? We could compute it, but the approach towards the mass, so finite time dynamics, we cannot compute. It's very, very complicated. And it's just as complicated or even more complicated than simulate you know, computing real time dynamics of integrable models. It's notoriously difficult. So, this is what I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that if you have an integrable model, you can establish integrability, you can establish existence of ballistic transport, existence of conserved charges, algebraic properties, Young Baxter equation, etc., etc. But actually, computing time dependence of local operators is very hard, very difficult. And people are working on it. They have results for in different situations, but generally it is not, not known, not solvable. So by solvable, I mean there is no good procedure in these quantum models. In classical models, maybe yes, but uh, even that is difficult. But in quantum models, even though they are integrable, real-time dynamics is very difficult. And this is the same also for our, our Lindbad systems. So we can do non-equilibrium steady states. It's also interesting, so maybe we, we get some interesting physical behavior, but approach towards the mass is, is too difficult. Okay, and uh, uh, in the remaining time, I want to show you, as I promised here, I want to show you examples for integrable Lindblads. Uh, I mean, I, maybe for a discussion after my talk, we can discuss how these integrable Lindblads are found, but I think that's, that's more technical, so I didn't want to include it in this talk. I, I, instead, I want to show you examples. And basically, I want to show you two main examples. The first example was found by Prozen, Tomasz Prozen, and Fabian Esther in uh, actually a little bit earlier, 2016. And in the and this this paper actually somehow started this di direction. Afterwards, there were one or two, or well, maybe three papers which showed examples, but no strategic approach to the problem. But it's very important because they showed the first example. First example where Lindblad equation can be integrable. And what they found is that we should take Hamiltonian to be the XX model Hamiltonian, where Hamiltonian is such that summation over J, sigma plus minus, let me just write it down, J, J plus one, J, J plus one. This is an XX model. And we take the XX model and we choose Lindblad jump operators, which are actually not two side operators, it's even simpler. I, I say that Lindbad jump operator will be a one side operator, which is, for example, projector to spin one, if you want, or it can be also projector to spin one. So I, I just write, for example, one minus uh, sigma, let's do one plus sigma z, uh, no, sigma z on side j over two. So in a matrix representation, this is one, zero, zero, zero. And this is a, this is a one side operator. And I identify this with LJ 
j plus one, and then I get the lambda density here because here it's already, already verified completely when I say that this is Hamiltonian, this is lambda operator. What is the physics of this, this lambda term? So somehow you can see that this lambda term it does not uh, move particles around. So it does not, uh, I mean, it does not move particles. And also what it does, it does not uh, create and does not add any particle. So particle number is completely, completely conserved and this term will not contribute to transport. It is a local term which is diagonal, and you know in quantum mechanics a diagonal term means that uh, you change the phase. So somehow this is a dephasing term, and this is a dephasing term which is added globally in a space homogeneous way, and it just turns out that this dephasing term actually contributes to heating. So this is what it does, but what it will do is it uh, shapes out phases in your model, and the system will heat up, and it will turn out that this model, when you have this in the operator. It doesn't matter what is your initial state and what is your initial density matrix. It will go to infinite temperature density matrix. Infinite temperature density matrix is basically the rho is proportional to the identity. Of course, when I, when I write rho is proportional to identity, it means that uh, here uh, different spin sectors are mixed. I mean, spin is conserved, so global spin is conserved. So it means that we should take a certain. Um, uh, pro pro projectors of this density matrix to uh, subspaces with uh, fixed spin. And actually, you can prove a general statement that if your Linda operator, uh, local Linda operator, is such that it is Hermitian, J, J plus one dagger, then from this it follows that the infinite time uh, state uh, rho will be proportional to the density matrix, or more precisely, the proportional to the identity matrix. More, more precisely, the identity matrix is always a solution to the Lindberg equation such that the time dependence is zero. So the, the non equilibrium steady state is defined such that Lindberg superoperator acting on, no, sorry, Lindberg superoperator super operator acting on the infinite time state is zero, such that it does not, it does not evolve anymore. So time dependence is zero. This is where the system will approach in the long time limit. And then this, this diving, it, it is uh, heating, as I said, it heats up to infinite temperature. And then what was found by Rosen and Esther is a simple observation. If you take this Lindell operator, you plug it here, then basically here, the interaction term that you get, interaction between the two copies, is just the Hubbard interaction term. So you can interpret this model as uh, two copies of XX model, plus the interaction term between the, the two uh, copies. This, this will be actually trivial, these terms will be something like a magnetic field or something, but this is a coupling between two models, uh, two copies of your model, and then this is exactly the Hubbard Hamiltonian. So it turns out that the Lindblad superoperator is basically the Hubbard Hamiltonian with some kind of imaginary coupling. And this was the first case of integrable Lindblad operator, and then uh, they investigated some of the properties, but not much. So basically what I can say is that uh, the most important observation is that infinite temperature state is basically uh, no infinite time state is basically the infinite temperature state. Other than that, not not really not much was computed. And then we also found that an interesting other state, and this will be my second and last example. Not state model. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit tired. I'm mixing up words. So we found an integrable model with a different type of Lindblad jump operator. It is fine-tuned, but nevertheless, I would say very interesting. We found actually many more models, but they are uh, in some sense uh, less interesting. I, I'm now showing you the most interesting model. We called it uh, the, the model um, B3 in, in our paper. I think this is the most interesting example of what we found. So we say that we are dealing with the lingua jump operators at JJ plus one, which have a coupling constant the coupling constant is gamma, it's a real number. And it, so it's a two side operator, and we are still looking at uh, spin one half systems. So it's a two side operator on spin one half. So this will be a four by four matrix. And it has the following concrete form here we have gamma, here we have gamma, and here we have one, here we have minus one, here we have uh, i times gamma minus one, and here we have minus i times gamma plus one. Actually, we can add some twists here also, but it's not, not important. 
And what this what this Lindor operator tells you, first of all, it has a it has an overall coupling constant here, which means that we can continuously tune the strength of this operator from zero to some any kind of finite value. So we can we can continuously tune gamma to zero and back so, so that we can make these terms disappear, and then we, we can mix the interaction with the environment disappear. This is first observation, important observation. So it looks like a physical physical coupling constant, so to say. Then these terms are actually fine-tuned, and everything is important. Otherwise, it would not be integrable. But it, what's important that here we have a mixture of diagonal terms, which tells you uh, dephasing, but also propagation terms, because these two terms in the matrix they will make a <coughs> they will make a shift from plus minus to minus plus, etc. So these these two terms they move one spin down particle with respect to spin up particle. And then this, this means that this Lindor operator or this model, it gives you an integrable model of combined uh, quantum and classical propagation of spins. So we have a model where it's a combination of uh, yeah, classical and quantum propagation. And what, what, what we found for this model is actually very interesting. We computed what is the, the spin current. You can compute the spin current at the sum or particle current at the sum j. It has a very, very defined, um, no, not, not very defined, concrete formula. Let me look it up. It's here. It's, uh, well, no, now it's a disadvantage that uh, <clears throat> I have the, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm running out of time. I, I'm, not, I'm not writing it out. Sorry, it can be found in our paper. I will say some words about the spin current. It's a very defined formula. It's a two line formula, which depends on local particle numbers and uh, it can be done. Spin current has a quantum part, which comes from the usual X6 uh, model uh, um, time and time evolution, and also this uh, Lindblad part. And I also forgot to say that for these Lindblad parameters, we also have the X6 model as, as the starting initial Hamiltonian. And to finish finish the talk, what we also found for this model is that besides being integrable, it has a very interesting one equilibrium steady state. So also for this model, we looked at the, the steady state, which is which satisfies the equation that in the operator acting when it is zero. And it turns out that specifically for this model, the steady state is the following. Uh, actually, it will be a pure state, so not a mixed state, remarkably. It will be a pure state where the C is the following. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a tensor product of the following form. J goes from one to L, one over square root two. It is one and it is e to the i j, and I put here pi over two. And let me discuss what this is. So, if you look at such a, if you forget about the tensor product and just look at this state, it is a state which lies in the xy plane, so to say. But now this phase, it depends on the coordinate j. So, this is a, this is a vector which uh, has an orientation in xy plane, which changes uh, angle as you move along the chain. So this is so-called spin helix, spin helix state. So if, if you wish that this is z, z direction and you have, this is x, xy plane, then your spin helix state is something like this. As you move around, it changes direction. And it's very interesting that this spin helix state emerges as the infinite time limit of your, of your limb equation. And this we could prove explicitly by direct computation. It's a little bit mysterious why this happens, I and mean, why specifically this state will be a product state, and why specifically this one. I don't know. We computed it, but what is a little bit of physical interpretation that the Lindblad jump operators they give you a term which creates propagation along the along the chain, and this propagation is you see antisymmetric. So here we have gamma minus one, here we have gamma plus one. So this means that left and right propagation will be asymmetric. One, one of them will be stronger. So this Lindblad operator creates you a spin current in your model. And if you wait long enough, then this spin current will somehow organize itself into this spin helix state. And you can also prove that this spin helix state has a non-vanishing spin current. And physically, what is perhaps most interesting that this final state does not depend on your coupling constant gamma. So this means that you can choose your coupling constant as small as possible. You can allow a little bit of coupling, very little coupling. Even then, the if you wait long enough, this spin helix state will emerge. And there is also a little bit of physical interpretation for this using 
this picture of a greenhouse what I what I took what we took from uh, other papers uh, from uh, actually Zara Lenarcic, um, that you can have a driving which is a very small driving but if this driving couples to one of your conserved charges in your model which in this case is the spin current it's also conserved in XX model then if you push uh, some kind of uh, quantities of uh, this conserved charge into the model, it will not decay because otherwise it's conserved. So if there will be more wind, but it will be conserved. So it cannot decay. And then it will just grow into a finite value eventually, even though your coupling, the strength, the strength of your driving can be very small. And then this is uh, somehow an analogy of the greenhouse effect. You shine a little bit of light into your greenhouse, but light energy will not come out and it will stay there somehow. And the, non-equilibrium steady state uh, will be of much higher temperature than the outside world. And this is also what happens here, that very small driving can lead to a finite particle current in this model. And basically, this is what we observed. And I think I'm at the end of my, my talk. So a little bit of summary. So we, we, have, a, we have a method for finding such integrable lean blood jump operators. We did a classification of these, uh, these models. And we found specific examples. So it's not, not too many, but specific examples. We will actually continue and we will publish an uh, upcoming uh, paper on this uh, in the coming time, sometime. Um, and for the models, what we could do, we could compute the NES, the NES, the non equilibrium steady state, and look at some of, some of these properties. But uh, the research is in very early stages so, so far. I don't know how much can be done, but of course, more important would be to compute the time evolution towards the mass. So finite time dynamics also, but that is very complicated. And I'm not sure how much can be done. So we have, we have integrable input operators. We have conserved linear operators, which somehow commute with these non hermitian matrices. But the effect of these non hermitian other linear operators is not understood. So, so far, so far, nobody came up with a good use of it. So it remains to be seen how far we can go with this integrable ingredients. It's, uh, it's early in this direction. I cannot tell how much uh, can be done in future. We have these examples, and this is in, in the paper. So thank you.